There is a sickness in the hearts of all of us. Inside of every PC enthusiast is an overclocker yearning to be let loose, spurred on by the promise of untapped potential, of bigger numbers in benchmarking programs, and all for the low, low cost of a few mere hours or days of your life. And probably quite a lot of stability. Most enticing of all is the forbidden fruit, the processor that yearns to be set free but is shackled by the limitations of its BIOS. In this video, I let my inner sicko loose to find out how high I could get this Ryzen APU to fly. This was going to be a straightforward mini PC review. GMK Tech sent me a review sample of the Evo X1, and I was intending to compare its HX370 CPU and integrated Radeon 890M iGPU with an external RX 7600M XT graphics dock connected over Oculink. That video had to be delayed, hopefully only by a week or so, but in the meantime I wanted to do something a bit different. The Ryzen 9 HX370 was, until very recently, AMD's flagship APU. This 12-core, 24-thread chip, comprising 4 performance and 8 efficient cores, powers a whole bunch of laptops and handhelds, and even with the existence of the HX395, it remains a capable performer in games. The big attraction for gamers is, of course, that Radeon 890M. With 1024 RDNA 3.5 cores and a clock speed of up to 2.9 GHz. The problem with these APUs is that they're often held back by the computers they're in. Handhelds, laptops, and mini PCs like the Evo X1 aren't really designed with tuning in mind, and it's often down to the community to produce the tools needed to squeeze extra performance from them. I started off doing what I thought was the bare minimum to get the APU working at its best, bumping up the power profile to performance, the TDP to 54 watts, and maxing out the frequency of the soldered 32GB of LPDDR5 RAM, which seemed to be the only real controls the BIOS has for affecting performance. Then I made the mistake of seeing what else could be done to extract the most juice possible, and found myself falling down a rabbit hole. Level 2 of the overclocking um, iceberg consisted of Universal x86 Tuning Utility. This is, as the name suggests, a similar idea to Intel's Extreme Tuning Utility, which I've used many times in the past to unlock performance in Intel-powered mini-PCs. It's not quite as powerful as XTU or Ryzen Master, as it doesn't allow for directly affecting multipliers or voltages and also lacks stuff like RAM and iGPU overclocking, but it does allow for limited control over AMD's Curve Optimizer. Like with so many of AMD's architectures over the years, Zen and RDNA chips are known for being able to boost up to higher clock speeds when they have more thermal and power headroom. So, somewhat paradoxically, dropping voltages can actually increase clock speeds. CO does this in a safer, more auto-magic way than straight up undervolting, and UXTU lets us apply this control to the CPU in this mini PC, which, at least in the stock X1 BIOS, lacks any kind of curve optimizer control at all. Unfortunately, it didn't have the greatest of impacts here. Clearly the HX370 isn't starred for power or cooling in this PC, and applying minus 15 to the CPU and GPU had almost no impact on performance in Cyberpunk 2077. Increasing the PBO scaler, which I'm gonna admit I don't really know what it's for, but it did offer the only real increase in performance, taking frames up from 52 FPS at 1080p low to uh, 54. Okay, so not earth-shattering, but it's free performance, and it gets us one step closer to 60. Unfortunately, this was about as far as I was going to get in UXTU. I tried changing some of the TDP-related settings, dragging sliders for the various power limits and boost durations, but without actually affecting anything. The next level of the iceberg was, for me, the most important and the most difficult one. 
As mentioned before, the RAM is soldered LPDDR5. This is currently the best option out there for mini PCs and handhelds, as it means for much higher clock speeds and far lower latencies compared to SODIMPs. APUs live or die by RAM performance, as it feeds not just the CPU but also the GPU. However, I'd already maxed out the clocks on the RAM, so I thought there wasn't any more room to grow, but that would prove to be a mistake. There is in fact a whole section of the BIOS for tuning memory timings, and although this was somewhat daunting for me, I had some help from Alexi, the viewer who provided the RTX 3080 Ti-M and 4090M Franken GPUs in the past. He has a far better grasp on RAM timings, and also managed to spot something I didn't. The numbers punched into the BIOS don't directly translate into actual timings, because they're hexadecimal. You have to convert the desired numbers from decimal first. So, for example, dropping the cast latency from 28 to 22 meant inputting the number 16. After several hours of frustrating trial and error, I settled on some timings that seemed stable enough, but were far lower than the default settings. This time, Cyberpunk enjoyed another similar sized jump in performance as it did from enabling Curve Optimizer. The 54 FPS average increased to over 56, and at this point you might think we're not really gaining anything, but look at the percentile lows. Curve Optimizer had little to no effect on 1% or 0.1% frame rates. In fact, I did several runs and found that 0.1s could fall as low as 31 FPS sometimes. Tightening up the memory timings increased those minimums by more than 10%, which is actually the biggest single improvement we've seen so far. After having wasted a few more hours trying to get even better timings, and coming to the conclusion that this was as good as it was going to get, I delved into the deepest layer of the iceberg. You see, the thing holding me back from the maximum potential of this APU was still the BIOS itself. Unlike some mini PCs I've seen, the GMK Tech unit doesn't have any control over PBO limits, which is why I'm forced to using third party utilities like UXTU. Unfortunately, even with UXTU, we can't use the overclocking aspect of PBO. Without that control, the processor is pretty much stuck at its rated speeds. In other similar PCs, you'd be able to increase or decrease clocks on both the CPU and GPU by up to 200MHz, and even with the latest 1.3 BIOS installed, that's just not possible on the EVO X1. Or is it? Yes, of course it is. I wouldn't have said anything otherwise. Alexi pointed me in the direction of a GitHub project called Smokeless UMAF, which is... How do I describe it? It's a program you install onto a USB stick, and when you boot your PC, after making sure to change your boot priority to put USB drives ahead of internal SSDs, it presents you with an alternative UI for your BIOS, including settings which have been hidden or omitted from the original. Now, I have to stress here, there are a ton of warnings on the GitHub page about the very real possibility of bricking your system, so be very careful about using it and about what changes you make when you're in there. The first time I used it, I carried over all of my settings from UXTU, and while I did get into Windows, Cyberpunk didn't even get to the red text, the whole PC hard reset. Being more cautious, I used Smokeless only to increase the PBO limit of the GPU by the maximum of 200MHz, and this time it worked. Cyberpunk saw an improvement of… f*** all. Actually, percentile lows were a bit better, but the average was literally the same, which left me with one final stone to turn, the CPU clock. I didn't have much hope that this would make a difference, but… Hey, Cyberpunk's a CPU intensive title, so maybe by going back into smokeless UI and increasing the CPU offset by 200MHz as well, perhaps it would… No, that made it worse. Not by a lot, but definitely not an improvement either. So, after all that effort, the last couple of levels of the tuning iceberg turned out to be mostly pretty pointless as far as Cyberpunk performance is concerned. With some memory tuning and curve optimization, I managed to get from 52 FPS at 1080p low to 56 FPS with slightly improved frame pacing, and all without having to touch that game's terrible FSR implementation. But what did it do for other games?
I didn't stop and check every variable in every game, so I compared results from my initial setup with a couple of basic BIOS tweaks to one with tune timings, minus 15 curve optimizer, and plus 200 to the GPU. Starting with Spider Man 2 and. <laughs> whoa! Is this an earthquake? Because there's a seismograph going crazy in the corner of my screen. At 1080 medium without FSR, the HX 370 is capable of a 30 FPS average. But as soon as you start swinging through the city, the stutter goes absolutely nuts. Adding quality FSR does something for the averages, but 1% and 0.1% are still abysmal. Just the kind of situation that demands some overclocking, right? Well, uh, no. Sans FSR, there appears to be a small benefit, but with FSR turned on, that benefit vanishes and probably indicates it was all just run to run variants. I did find a surefire way of stabilising the frame rate, though, if you don't like the words frame generation, then you probably don't want to hear it. Kingdom Come Deliverance 2 offers about 41 FPS stock, with 0.1% lows of 31. Tuning the CPU and memory seems to do pretty much nothing for performance overall, though the percentile lows might be a tiny bit better. Red Dead Redemption, the original, not the sequel, is obviously an older title that's ideally suited to playing on integrated graphics, and at 73 FPS on average it's a very playable experience, though the low end does dip a bit too far below 60 for my liking. Again, tuning doesn't do much for the average, but it does smooth out the frame times a bit. I was pleased to get a very playable experience out of GTA V Enhanced Edition, even with a fair amount of RT enabled, though it did require some FSR to get into the 50s. This time, tuning the APU had a small benefit across the board, but not one that's really noticeable, and could easily have been down to the difference in time of day as much as anything. Finally, yeah. Black Myth Wukong actually does slightly worse with tuning, though only within a frame per second. At native resolution it's only just over 30 FPS, which is pretty rough going for this type of game, but at 67% upscaling it's actually quite playable, and while the low preset does look terrible in terms of textures and shadows, it could even be an enjoyable experience. That would be a pretty depressing end to the whole saga, except for one thing I didn't talk about. The thing all overclocking is basically built around. The reason we do it in the first place. 3D Mark. <laughs> 3D Mark Time Spy is something I begrudgingly feature in my mini PC reviews, mainly to have a nice, easy reference point for comparing systems against one another. I'm not a real fan of it, I don't think it's got much real world meaning, but it's actually very useful for overclocking. In fact, this whole experiment got turned into a video because I got a decent time spy result, and Alexi pointed out that it was already pretty close to the top of the leaderboard for the HX370. The purpose behind this tuning odyssey, this deep dive into the APU iceberg, became about reaching the top of the time spy leaderboard. That top spot would become my white whale, my personal Everest, the whole meaning of my life for about 12 hours. In that time, I ran benchmark after benchmark, trying everything I could think of. My best run had been 4319, which put me second on the leaderboard for HX370s overall, losing out slightly to Yoman Cardenas in GPU score. Every subsequent benchmark, even at the same settings, didn't hit the same level. I saw 4318, 4316, 4311, but nothing was working. In fact, playing with PBO settings in Smokeless was actually having a negative effect, sending scores in exactly the wrong direction. So I came back with a new strategy. I disabled the Smokeless enhancements and just stuck to tuned memory timings and curve optimizer. Running the benchmark again and, oh my god, 4386! I, I blitzed it! I beat the first place holder by over 60 points! But, wait, oh, what the hell? It didn't count for some bullshit reason. I ran it again, certain that it wouldn't do so well a second time around, but no, it worked. In fact, it was even better. 
My final score of 4394 was higher not only than the best HX370, but it was better than the best HX375, an APU I didn't even know existed before this benchmark. It won't last, of course. Things never do. But it's nice to feel that for one shining moment, I was good at something. Not anything important. After all, the games didn't benefit even the slightest. But it was a big number. And big numbers are what this whole industry is all about. Thanks for watching. Kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.